please welcome Madam Gandhi, Kaleo, and Tita. So I was last here in uh, May of 2019, June of 2019, for the graduating class of that year. And six months later, I went out to India in February of 2020 to make this music video. And this music video like, was so obviously in inspired uh, by my time here in the Green School. You know, it's big Green School energy. I grew up uh, very much like in strict uniforms and all girls schools, you know, and, and I always was the one who wanted to kind of be off in nature and like wear uh, interesting, free, creative clothing. And I was always like asked to be restricted. So this music video, you know, really was this kind of opportunity for me to dream up the world that I wanted to want, like, wish to live in. And, you know, the fact that it was six months after my time at the Green School and then like perfectly shot before the pandemic actually happened and everything was shut down, it just felt like it was a really big miracle. So, you know, you all are inspiring me. I get to make music videos that other people get to see. I mean, the influence that we have on each other is really quite uh, profound. So I wanted to just lay the stage uh, by sharing that. So thank you for letting me show the video. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right. Um, so I guess to start us off, Kieran, do you maybe want to introduce yourself and kind of the work that you do. Yes, absolutely. Um, my name is Kiran Gandhi. I perform as Madam Gandhi. I grew up between New York City and India, and I had two fairly traditional Indian parents. You know, when I was living in New York City, we had a school bus that would pick us up. And when we were in front of the parents, the school bus driver would play the classical music station, you know, like the Beethoven and like peaceful violin. I would be in the school bus, kindergarten, me and the other kids, as soon as the bus driver would close the door and we would drive away from the parents, he would turn it back to the hip hop station. So, you know, in, in New York City, 1990s, you know, we were listening to Nas and Lauryn Hill. And one thing that I understood as a young person is that music is such a rich opportunity for storytelling. And even more so than storytelling, it's such a rich opportunity for empathy building because you're instantly able to understand somebody else's walk of life, somebody else's perspective. And specifically, I was listening to Nas, I was listening to Lauren Hill. Nas is talking about a New York City experience that's happening just blocks away from where I live, and yet it's a radically different experience than I'm, I'm living in New York City. And so I understood as a young person, music really is such a beautiful way to connect with people, open people's hearts, minds through the beats, through the, lyric, through the rhythms. And then lyrics are essentially like mantra. They're opportunities to really change the human psyche and push us all forward. So from a young age, I knew that music and activism really was a space where I could exist and, and add value. Some questions. Um, we're wondering how, um, related to activism, how do you get inspired to bring your message and share that with the world? Uh, <laughs> pretty broad. Um and spread positivity through your work? I think, you know, the, the question is how do I, what's what motivates me to spread yeah. the word? You know, I think impact. All of us have so much potential to create positive change, whether it's in a one-on-one -on -one interaction or it's in a group interaction. I'll never forget, I was in my second uh, year at business school at Harvard, I was in Boston. It was 2015. My first year, I was hired to be the drummer for an artist called MIA. And so I'd be in school, and then I'd also go be drumming. We'd go to Japan, we'd go to Chile, performing on big stages. And the truth is that I had never been to so many of these countries. I felt so grateful that my drumming was allowing me to be in an all-female project in big stages, really changing people's perception of what is possible. It really gave me a lot of confidence. It gave me a lot of meaning because I felt like I was in the classroom learning um, about business, albeit from like, you know, kind of the breeding ground of like capitalism is Harvard Business School, you know? So, you know, you have to be grateful for certain elements of the education. And then you also have to kind of be critical about the parts that uh, maybe are not so uh, good for the world. My second year, because the tour had ended, I felt a bit depressed, to be honest with you. I felt like, my identity was really attached to being this drummer for MIA, for, for getting external validation. And I felt really like low confidence. I felt like, you know, touring is not so healthy, you know, so I didn't feel my health was so good. And I remember having this moment when it was cold in Cambridge, snowing, and at six, seven in the morning, I would see these runners on the Charles River, okay, running in the hail, 
running in the snow, in the sleet, like it's nothing, you know, happy, strong, just like joyful, doing their thing. And I remember seeing these runners like, wow, this is badass, you know, this is like remarkable. I want to have this kind of confidence, this kind of power. And so, you know, sometimes when we have jealousy of somebody else, that jealousy can be one of the most useful emotions because jealousy shows us what it is that we want for our own life. Does that make sense? When you see somebody doing something that you like, it's a source of inspiration. It's an opportunity for us to say, thank you for showing me what's possible. So I started running. And I didn't tell anybody, you know, I wasn't competitive, like, yeah, let's share apps, you know, like, let's be friends on my fitness pal. No, thank you. Okay, it was a real private experience, R ran nice and slowly. You know, I said, worst comes to worst, I can Uber myself home, okay, take a Gojek, keep it pushing. So I started to run. I started to run. One week, I'd run three miles. The next week, I'd run six miles. Two, three weeks after that, I'd find myself hitting, for the first time in my life, 10 miles. I felt proud of myself. It was this opportunity for me to rebuild my confidence from the inside out, to, cut, to get in touch with my own potential rather than seeking validation from the outside. A friend of mine convinced me to join her to go out to run the London Marathon. So I showed up to the London Marathon start line and I realized I was about to be on day one of my period. And for those of you here who don't have a period, who don't bleed every month, let me tell you what you're not trying to do on day one of your cycle, okay? It's run 42 kilometers, 26 miles, okay? So like many of us who have been caught unprepared, and I know it's a bit of a long answer to your question, but the truth is that it's important to understand our own personal power as a desire to contribute to world change. I remember analyzing my options at the start line of the marathon on day one of my period. I said, listen, a pad is not good for this scenario. I didn't have a 3D printed green school moon cup, you know, on me at the time. A tampon, you know, I suppose so, but, but I didn't feel like it was an appropriate solution for four hours of running. You know, I didn't want like a half in, half out situation while I'm on the run. There's no uh, privacy to change it out on the marathon course. So I honestly was like, I feel like just bleeding freely and running would be the best solution for myself and my body in this moment, okay? Now, of course, I knew it was like a radical choice. I never really heard of anybody doing that, but I just was making the choice that I thought was most appropriate for myself and my body. We start to run, I'm bleeding, mile eight, mile 10, mile 15. It was one of the most profound experiences of my life. I said, wow, most days on day one of my cycle, I'm like curled up in bed watching Netflix, eating chocolate. You know, I'm not out here running champion style. I felt proud, I felt strong, I felt motivated. They tell you you're gonna hit a wall in the marathon, but we hit mile 20, mile 25, and crossed the finish line, we didn't even stop running. And so when I crossed that finish line and I felt so proud of my body, I felt proud of my mind, I felt proud of setting a goal from a place of wanting to build up my own sense of power, it made me wanna write that story. Because all over the world, millions of women and girls and people who bleed, trans folks, don't have that same opportunity to choose what's right for themselves and their body. And moreover, that stigma is one of the most effective ways of oppressing our society because it prevents us from talking and sharing information. When this story went viral, it changed my life because it showed me the power of us stepping into our own mind, what we think is right for our own selves, our own body. And sometimes when we go first with just the most smallest ounce of bravery, when we use our own critical thinking, when we say, listen, I don't know about other people, but this oppressive norm doesn't work for me. So I'm going to do what's best for myself and my body. Global conversation happened. In the past seven years, the amount of times that menstruation and stigma and these words have been used on Google search alone is like uh, exponential. All over the world, so many more innovative brands are now starting to solve these problems related to stigma, related to comfort. Even in the States, we're talking a lot more about homeless folks who bleed, folks who are incarcerated who bleed. So the reason why I feel motivated is that small acts of bravery have profound impact on our society. And the concept of the butterfly effect, where a change here can affect a myriad of impact somewhere else far away down the line because we're all connected it's so clear to me, it's so clear to me. And so that's why I feel motivated because when we step into our own personal power, you don't know the potential of impact you might have.
So, Kieran, um, doing the work that you do, have you ever faced any negativity? And if you do, um, how do you react to that when you see words of neg negativity um, creating power or used by people in power? Yes, I love this question. So when people give us negative feedback, okay, I pay attention to two things. This is relevant to all of you. This is a life lesson. Are you listening? Yeah. I've taken 33 years to learn this. You're at the tender ages of 15 and 16 and 17, you know? I'm saving you some time. When people give negative feedback, I pay attention to two things. One is, what is the energy with which they are giving that feedback? Does it have a bullying energy? Does it have a mean energy? Does it have a negative energy? Or is the energy that they are giving me this criticism provide me with the opportunity to grow? The second thing I pay attention to is the content. Regardless of how they're giving the feedback, is it good information? Is it a true opportunity for me to grow? I've been in so many scenarios, whether it was the marathon, whether it's my music, whether it's my work going to Antarctica to sample climate change, climate sounds. When people give feedback with the complaining energy, with the negative energy, it already makes us not want to listen to it. But that actually can hold us back because most criticism, negativity is an opportunity for us to grow. It's an opportunity for us to receive good information that usually it's given in like a lower stakes environment prevents us from making larger mistakes in the future. So that's what I do first. If I notice it's a negative energy, I try to remove that person's rudeness, meanness, bullying from uh, my own, you know, feeling hurt or feeling bad. And then I pay attention to the content. Is this good advice? Is this good feedback? Is this something that I absolutely should be integrating into my work and paying attention to? Because most of the time, if someone gives you positive praise, good, good, you've done some work, you're on the journey, people are affirming what you're doing, they like it, good, you've done something right. And if they're criticizing you, okay, good, opportunity to grow, good, expand as a human. Even if they're saying it in a rude way, can I pay attention to the kernel of wisdom that's inside of that? If the content of the criticism is not something that I agree with, okay, I've removed their negativity and I've given it back to them. So this allows me to take and integrate what's good information rather than being defensive, rather than protecting bad behavior. So many times we have cancel culture. Cancel culture, they're done. I really don't like this notion of cancel culture. It prevents us from growing as a society. With cancel culture, of course, if there's a repeat offender, if they're not showing any desire to change, if they notoriously a problem, okay, I understand the need to say no. We're not gonna consume their films anymore. We're not gonna watch their, you know, uh, buy their product products anymore, of course. But I'd like to live in a world where we give people nuance and opportunity to grow. And we give them that feedback, believing in their potential to change. This is the world that I wanna live in. Um, next question. Um, do you do you believe, as an artist and as a, uh, I guess, influencer, um, that you uh, have a responsibility to um, create change and uh, <laughs> spread a message? And um, could you give some advice for, to us who don't really have that platform? What can we do? in your opinion? Yes, I love this question, thank you. For me, from the beginning, my art and my music has always been embedded with the intention to make change. I've chosen to make art because I want to push us forward in terms of how we understand gender, in terms of how we understand personal power, in terms of how we understand making the world a better place. I've decided I'm only making art for this reason. I'm not making it to be top 40. I'm not making it for free outfits. I'm not making it for fame. I'm making it because I see the potential of music as a medium for effective social change. Does that make sense? So in my case, it is appropriate for me to expect feedback and expect people to say, no, we look up to you. We want you to be using your music for social change. The artists who have not created that intention, I don't know if it's fair for us to say, hey, 
you know, you have a responsibility to do this and that. I don't know, because they never asked for that responsibility. They never said, hey, I'm a world leader, you know, with my sexist music, I'm a world leader, and now I'm not gonna make sexist music. It, that's not the vibe, that's not the truth of what it is. So I don't think we need to do that. At the same time, do I wanna live in a world where each of us, regardless of who we are, see the power of our own potential and want to create change? Of course, that's my vision for the future. But we can't expect something from someone that they don't have to give, so I don't. In terms of you and you and you, I think that when I was, when I was 15, 16, 17, I would take the smallest drumming gigs here or there. I would learn how to DJ and I would DJ these like cheesy parties in New York City or because I was under 21, they would like put big X's on my hands so that I wouldn't be able to drink, but that I could still play the show, which was actually really cool. You know, when you're 18, 19, 20, you're in college, I would take every internship related to music. I would use my intelligence to help them do the office admin stuff just so that I could hang with the musicians at the record label. If you want to be part of something that can push you forward, in my case, I wanted to be part of the biggest record labels. I wanted to drum for the biggest artists. You have to show how you can add value to them, not how they can add value to you. When people apply for internships, for jobs, I always see the biggest mistake made. I want this internship because I think that Sony Music can teach me how to be a better music business person. They already know that. They don't care. They know that they can do that for everybody. What can you provide to Sony Music? What can you provide to a big artist? What can you provide to somebody who can mentor you? People reach out and they'll say, you know, hey, can I pick your brain? It's like, yeah, of course, but you have to hang. Like, come and do some work, and then you will, like, you know, get some knowledge along the way. This is really how it should work. A lot of times when we're young, though, we have this self-sabotaging thought, which is, no, but what could I possibly contribute? I'm just 14 years old, barely trying to make it to class on time. What could I contribute? No, you have to smartly think. I can contribute this, this, and this. I can contribute a joyful attitude. I can contribute the fact that I've lived in Bali and lived all over the world and have a global perspective. I can contribute sustainability. I can help your office get to zero waste. Wow, <laughs> you'd make their office way more relevant in 10 minutes of your time, truly. So really the biggest thing you can do when you're starting off is work with people who are advanced in the space that you are trying to get involved in but start by adding value to what they're doing so that you always have a job and you always have a space in these larger, more effective companies. Thank you. Um, I can see that you have a very clear passion for music and uh, drumming. How did you uh, come to find that passion and um, how important do you think it is to lead life following your passions? Oh, this is the best question. I've been waiting for this one. The reason why I like the question, the second part of his question, your pronouns are he, him? Yes, and yours? She, her, and mine are she, her, good. So the, the, the reason why I love the question of why is it important to follow your passions, I'm gonna answer the second question. Any time in my life that I have done something from a heart space, it pays dividends. Any time in my life when I've done something from, oh, but I have to do this in order to eventually do this to then maybe potentially do this, it's an instant failure, for me anyway. Well, every time in my life where I was like, okay, well, the resume needs to have a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that in order to prove that I'm this, this, this. No, failure. It just doesn't work because it's not authentic. It's not real, at least for me. In my life, every time where I have found something through the space of like, oh, that just sounds cool, that sounds fun, that sounds like it's gonna light me up. The reason why those experiences have paid dividends is because by the nature of me wanting to be there with my whole presence, with my whole light, with my whole belief, my whole desire, I'm not checking my phone, I'm not waiting for lunchtime, I'm hyped to be there, I'm excited. Me being present allows miraculous opportunities to come as a result. You notice, you make friendships that are real. 
One time I got invited to speak at a school, an all girls school, just like the one that I grew up in New York City. I was so excited to be there. It was the first time that I got to speak about experiencing bullying as a kid in an all girls school setting. So it meant a lot to me personally to go to that school and speak. I had to cancel a couple of things and an opportunity to travel, but I really wanted to speak and that was the only date they could give me. So I showed up happy to be there. The next day, I got an email from a parent of a student who was in the classroom who really loved the talk. She's like one of the top CEOs at Netflix, okay, casually. Since that day till now, my music has been in like maybe seven or eight Netflix shows just because of that one experience. I have so many countless moments like this where I have shown up just with good energy, with positivity, and because I want to be there. And as a result of that, boom, something leads to the next and the journey continues elevating. So that is why it's very important, at least for me and my experience, to lead from a space of passion. Because then I'm wholly present to notice the infinite possibility of opportunities around me. When I'm small and I don't wanna be there, I'm not present, I'm not noticing. So my journey doesn't expand, it contracts. Is it too spiritual or was it at least some practical, some spiritual? Half, half. Just following up on that, do you believe that passions have to be purposeful and well, yeah, have a purpose? No, I don't believe that passions have to be purposeful. Passions have to give you joy, and joy lights you up. Joy is fuel, joy is love energy. Joy is, oh my gosh, I love when you smile. You seem really happy, like what, what, what are you on, you know? This, this. I love being around people who are happy people. They don't need anything from you, they self-sufficient. I wanna be like these people. So I say that passions do not need to be purposeful, but the reason why I think purpose should come from your passion is because you will always have something to give. When we feel we are doing charity work, already the intention is a bit skewed because you thinking you doing somebody else the favor. So what happens there? Over time, resentful, over time, bored, over time, depleting yourself. I believe that when we are giving from a space of like, no, 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 I don't need anything back. This is the joy. I'm so happy to be here. No, 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 I don't need anything from you. I'm so grateful. Then the quality of interaction has longevity. It's sustainable. So. No, I don't think that passion has to be purposeful, but I think if you want to create purpose and change in the world, it should come from a place of passion, joy, love. Thank you, Karen. Have there been any challenges that you've encountered um, following your passions and doing the work that you do, and how did you navigate through that? Yes, the pandemic. <laughs> Did anyone have a difficult pandemic, sort of? Yeah, yeah. One thing that I've experienced is that before the pandemic, everything was go, go, go. This thing that I was sharing with you of atomic living, moment to moment, I'll be in one space, and then as a result of that interaction, it leads to the next thing, to the next thing. I felt like really powerful and passionate um, in terms of my career. When the pandemic hit, no more getting on a plane, no more performing, no more speaking, no more validation, no more pop, 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 pop. I had to be in my own energy. I had to be in my own thoughts. So then what happens? Self-doubt. Then what happens? Negative thought patterns. Then what happens? None of this matters. If there's a pandemic forever, who needs the artist? You know, like this negative mentality. I learned a lot in that pandemic. I learned a lot that, again, again, my identity can't come from external validation. It has to come from a source of self-love. I mean, this is like rhetoric on the internet right now, self-love, go get a massage, this and that. I'm not talking about purchasing self-love, okay? I'm talking about sitting for meditation. I'm talking about going inward. I'm talking about positive self-rhetoric. I'm talking about self-awareness, noticing when we have those negative thoughts and starting with the basics. Have you slept? Have you been eating right? Have you drunk water? Have you connected with a friend who loves you? Have you done something that you enjoy simply for the purpose of enjoyment? So I think my biggest challenge in my career that I definitely saw specifically in the pandemic when everything went quiet was my own negative thought patterns, my own you know, self-sabotaging mentality. And it's sometimes that same fear that can push us towards great things, 
but we have to actively manage it so that it doesn't self-sabotage or just make us cancel the whole career altogether. Yeah, thank you for asking. Thank you. Um, so Kieran, what do you think changing the world means? What does it mean to you? <laughs> what does it mean to you, Tirita? What does it mean to you, Kaleo? Oh, oh. <laughs> well, okay, I didn't expect to be answering the questions today. <laughs> I don't know, bringing about positive change and uh, spreading kindness, um, spreading joy, spreading what you believe in, um, having an impact on people that is significant, and yeah, kind of standing up for what you believe in and standing true to your values. Yeah, I mean, um, following up on Kaleo, I also believe that like changing the world is something that you do to make an impact, a positive impact for your community, whether it's local or global, it's just something that, um, yeah, that you enjoy and also can bring positive impact to the people around you. Yes. <laughs> when I think of changing the world, what comes to mind is when has the world changed me? When have the world? When has the world changed me? When has a beautiful conversation changed me? A moment in nature changed me? An opportunity to sit for yoga here two weeks in Bali? When has that changed me? Because when I remember how somebody else has lit me up, lit me up, or how an experience has lit me up, it motivates me to then want to give. And one thing I've also learned. Are you listening? One thing I've also learned is that it's not about a one-to-one. -one. I give to this person, now I expect something from that. No, we give here, we receive over here. I give something over here, I receive over here. Life is multidimensional, it's so beautiful, it's so rich. And so we never wanna give with the expectation. We give knowing that giving and receiving is part of the natural balance of life. That somebody else has nourished me so that I can now go and nourish somebody else. And so that for me is actually changing the world. I think, of course, we all have ego. We all want millions and millions of followers, this and that. You know, when I hang with the kids who have millions and millions of followers, I'm waiting for the depth. That's the real truth. I'm waiting for the depth. It's easy. It's easy to make 15 seconds of something. So easy. And yes, of course, so many of those TikToks and Instagrams have shown me something or inspired me. Absolutely, yes. But personal depth is a lifelong who knows what's gonna be there tomorrow. Instagram is already on the way out. Everybody's spending time building their Instagram followers. It's on the way out. TikTok is next, then what? Really what is the truth is your own alignment, your own ability to give, your own ability to say, hey, I hung with this person in the elevator and they gave me nice energy. So different, so much more powerful than seeing somebody who has millions and millions of this and that. No problem, you can have all that. Let's have a conversation. Can you hang for more than 15 seconds? Where is your depth? This is real power. And so for me, changing the world is saying, I want to be nourished by this world, and I want to give to this world. Um, so just following up on that, what ways have you found it effective to spread your message around the world? And what are some ways that have been ineffective? Mm. Great, I love this question. I love being with real human people. Even for me as a musician, being in the studio, like everyone loves the studio. I, I don't know, I don't think it's for me. Like I have to be in the studio to make the music. I love jamming with musicians, but I find it work. I find it like, ugh, like can the song just come out so that then I can perform it. I love real human interactions. I share that as an example because in your life over time, we have to notice and take evidence of ourselves. What lights me up and what drains me? What lights me up and what drains me? And then I start to optimize for what lights me up. I love to be with you. I love to be public speaking. I love to perform in real life. Even in the pandemic, of course, I was grateful to have virtual performance opportunities. But then the worst thing happens, you turn off your phone and you're by yourself. It's terrible. You know, it's like going on a date and then they just say goodbye and leave you. And you're like, well, you know, can we get a hug in these streets? You know, like something. So I felt like, wow, real humans light me up. Real human interaction lights me up. 
So I think in that way, it's just about noticing what it is that you're good at and doing that. Yeah. And then, sorry, you're asking me about ineffective ways to spread my message. <laughs> I, I've chosen a career that's slightly different. I don't feel like I'm a master of one thing. I feel like a lifelong learner. I'm here studying acro yoga. Has nothing to do with music, has nothing to do with activism, but what does it do? It lights me up, makes me feel strong, makes me feel positive, it creates serotonin, oxytocin release in my mind, allows me to learn how to give therapeutics to other people. I take the metaphors from acro yoga lifting other people up or being supported. And I integrate it into my talks because the messaging is profound by studying something that has absolutely nothing to do with my main career. But in life, we're multidimensional humans. So we have to be brave enough to honor that and go where the heart tells us to go. As a result of me choosing acro yoga, now I get to be here with you. See, it's just, there's countless examples of that. So I think ineffective is to self-stifle, to force yourself to do something you don't wanna do. I hear my friends complaining, oh, I have to promote on TikTok. Oh, I got to get my social media up. I don't know. I understand we all have to play the game. I'm more interested in what's true, what's honest, what's real, because that's sustainable. So in my life, I don't know. All of us have different goals. For me, my number one goal is to be happy so that I always have something to give. And so in that way, I optimize for aspects of my career that light me up, and I minimize aspects that drain me. Thank you. Um, and now bringing it back to the music video, um, I was curious to know, I saw a lot of yellow there and on your website as well. I was wondering um, if there's any significance behind that or what the meaning is of all the yellow. Yeah, I love the color yellow. I really do. I love it. My name is Kiran, which in Hindi and Sanskrit means ray of light. And I think for me, the yellow, if at the very least, is almost a reminder to myself to optimize for the light. When I feel dark energy, negative energy, depression, low vibes, it's important for me to remind myself to do things that re-imbibe me, reminding myself who I am and that I want to step into the light. It's very important for us to manage our own mental health proactively. There are so many things that I do to not even let it get to that point. Meditation in the morning, letting go of the coffee, no alcohol, no, no negative toxicity in the body, things like that. So for me, yeah, the yellow is about positivity, it's about joy, and I think it's, it really represents um, the core of what I think is my essential contribution. How do you think we as the youth can contribute to global change? You know I'm gonna give that one to you, and then I'll. Yeah. Go. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me how. Are you <laughs> um, I guess everything we're doing here at Green School is kind of contributing to global change. Um, kind of showing up, being active, taking projects that have a positive impact. Um, yeah, kind of going out of your way to do the things that will make the world a better place um, as opposed to just sitting at home and doing nothing. <laughs> um, yeah. I guess following up on what you said about passion, like, I think inevitably you just have to follow your heart and just follow through with your passions. And if that really is something that you enjoy doing, I think ultimately it will create a change of some sort. Even if it's not global, it will make a change and a difference in your personal life. I have a few thoughts on this. The first is that we all need each other. You know, the young people... We need to spend time with our grandparents. We need to listen, like, what do they have to say? You know, I think it's such a missed opportunity that we, we are so fragmented. The generations are fragmented. I think the older generations can provide leadership, foundation, funding. The younger generation can provide ideas, freshness. I think one thing that's missing is that intergenerational dialogue. Next week, I am so excited to go spend time with each of my four grandparents. I feel so excited. Whenever I leave them, I'm like, oh, this is my roots, this is my lineage, and I'm more motivated. 
when we don't have those uh, elders in our life, it's okay. We study them. We miss them. We honor them. What, what were they like when they were alive? What were they doing? What wisdom can their story offer us, their memory? This is one of the biggest things that I think is missing. The next thing is we do as young people need to spend time with the older generations so that there's some connection. We understand how an industry works in order to therefore make changes to it. I think that kind of stubborn, I can do better, is a bit childish and immature. I have to be self-aware and learn the industry at least a little bit to understand how you're going to change it and plug into it. And then from there, go and start your own thing. I really do think so. I think getting funding and being motivated to start your own thing really is how we build fast futures. Very hard to change huge, huge companies from within. I like the idea of us spending time with the industries we want to impact and then going and doing it differently. Thank you, Karen. All right. Before we wrap it up, um, we're going to have a little Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. Thank you so much. Uh, my question's about going to the Antarctica and recording. Like, I've never been. I don't know how many people here have been. Just like, what was that like? And how did you fill in that moment when you were recording it? But just generally, like, how did it look? How, you know, how did that impact you? Yes, thank you for this question. So this year, I had the real rich honor of going out to Antarctica, South Pole. And I was in this Stanford program. We're in class. We were taught how to construct underwater microphones, hydrophones. And they had taken us out to the bay to record whale sounds. That was just like for a class project. And so I had built a bunch of these underwater microphones. And I learned how to build them more and more robust. And like you're soldering and you have the goggles. And you're like really learning this cool thing. And so then it dawned on me like, what if you know, and then I had the opportunity to go to the Antarct to Antarctica on a separate, a separate reason, but I ended up combining the two projects. So I went out to Antarctica and I brought these underwater microphones and I started sampling the sound of glaciers melting underwater, the sounds of penguins, the sounds of seals, the sounds of whales, the sounds of real climate change. What does it sound like when the earth is literally melting? It sounds beautiful, it sounds tragic, it sounds like a symphony. And the idea really there is, I brought all those sounds back. And of course, those sounds alone are beautiful and we'll release them exactly as they are, raw. But the project that I'm most interested in is taking all of those raw audio material from Antarctica and actually shaping and sculpting the audio material into modern day electronic instruments. Things like kick drums, hi-hats, snares, synthesizers. We made a penguin synthesizer. We made an ice drum kit. We made a line cymbal. And so then the idea is, if my lyrics are good for you and the beats are 100% organically sourced, what if we could make music that really is just this clean, holistic, delicious, healthy music that's good for you when you listen to it? <laughs> and so this thesis is something that um, we already put a pack out uh, last year. It won an award um, for the fact that it was 100% organically sourced from nature, but it sounds like electronic beats. And now we're going to next year release the Antarctica pack. So that's the thesis of that project. And is the laptop still connected? Can I show an example? OK, while we take another question, I can show an example. Thank you. Any other questions for Kieran? Behind you. Hi, Kieran. Um, as a parent and as a wannabe musician, I uh, struggled with forcing myself to practice. Um, just like when you go for a run, you kind of have to force yourself a little bit. You say, it's so important to follow your passion and do everything that comes from love and joy. But deep down inside, there's also that hard grit dedication that you've got to give. Can you say some things about that? Because I have a hard time getting my kids off their screens to yes. do other things yes. <laughs> that I know they're going to love as soon as they just forget about the yes. screen. Please say something. I love this. Thank you. I thought you were asking this question for yourself. I thought you were saying it's hard for you to practice, and then you were saying it's actually asking for a friend. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a couple of thoughts on this, because I also find it like difficult to practice or do things that I know will make myself better, of course. The biggest, at least for me, is to set myself up to win. I will say, Kieran, can you just put 10 minutes of running? Put 10 minutes, you know, I will. And then as soon as I get going, most of the time when the 10 minutes come, then I'm like, okay, I can put more, fine, you know, I'm here already. 
Or, or I'll say, no, Kieran, you said it was 10 minutes. We're going home now. Fine. It's okay. You know, but then we done something. Can you put 10 minutes of practicing? Put a timer. Just put 10 minutes. You know, I set myself up to win. This is the bite-sized goal because then I'll do it. If it's overwhelming, then it's like, oh, I don't even want to start it. Even with emails, emails are rough. You know, I have to open my laptop and like, you know, get into the thing. But if I'm like, okay, send three, just do the three on the top. That's it. Then at least, you know, flow starts. So I think that's my biggest piece of advice, at least for ourselves. And then for the kids, it's got to be play. That's, I mean, to me, I can't wait to be a parent. I'm not a parent yet, but I think, I think it's play, right? Like if it's fun, the kids are going to do it. I mean, we adults, if it's fun, we're going to do it. I think it's got to be something with play, with gamification of the thing. Right now, all of the apps around music are all gamification. It's always like, teach your kids how to play guitar, but it's like a video game. Like, you know, it's like, unfortunately, we as humans uh, respond well to, you know, levels and tiers and, and small bite-sized achievements. So I think it's got to be something with that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so what this is, is individual bite-sized kick drums, snare drums, synthesizers, so that you as the creator would download all of these things and make your own beats. Does that make sense? Okay, so we made a pack for other musicians to be able to make cool stuff, and everything that you see here is stuff that I recorded from nature. Stamping on crispy leaves, um, hitting a twig to a, a stream, dropping a pebble in the ocean, things like that. Make sense? Are you ready to hear what it sounds like? It sounds really cool. I'm telling you now. This one's like kind of a trap. Okay, you can pause it, Ibu Harriet. So this, this is just an example of what could be made. Yeah. Hi, um, I wanted to ask, like, when you started with your passion and like began to fall in love with it, was there anyone that pushed you or you had a role model or was it all you? Definitely role models, thank you for this question. I remember when I was always invited to play piano one thing that I thought was a missed opportunity in the way that I was taught piano at seven, eight years old was that every week my homework was just to learn a little bit more of the song in the notebook. So obviously on the one hand that's cool because you're learning how to play music that people like, you're learning how to play piano and string things together. But the reason why I felt like that was a missed opportunity is because as a creative person, I wasn't just taught a bunch of different scales and then encouraged to have my homework be to just make my own song next week. That would have been a much better assignment. When I started playing the drums, however, it was really my drum teacher that opened up a whole world for me because he was not by the book. He was wild. He was like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Do what makes you feel good, you know? So as a kid, you're like, wait a second. Like, everyone's always telling me there's a right way and a wrong way. But he was like, yeah, cool. You want to put the symbol here? Let's try it. Like, he was very down to follow my lead as a young person. He liked that I was intuitively just playing or taking the stick and putting it upside down and playing the bottom of the drum. He liked a more creative approach. And so I think that really planted a seed and really guided me. And to this day, Frank and I are dear friends. You know, he's always like sending me these long messages. He's like, you're a genius. Like, I always knew it. You know, he's like so encouraging. He's like a dad energy, like that masculine, like you're awesome. Like, you know, don't ever forget it. Like, I think we all really need that motivational encouragement from, from all parents and, and all parental figures, mentors in our life. And so I think it was the notion of this mentor giving structure, but also encouraging my intuitive, childlike, playful desires uh, when it came to the drums. Thank you.
One last question. So you have th thinking about the passionate stuff, but I just thought about the logical, which is like business plan and become maybe not famous, but like influencer. But how did you even start the like being famous and becoming famous influencer? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, in my scenario, I don't even feel like I'm famous, but I appreciate that. I'll, I'll I feel that when the marathon story went viral. There was a lot of energy around my project, around my work. I was by no means a menstrual activist. I was just trying to cross the finish line in my own way, you know? But I was smart and I am gritty and I also believe in the message of what I was sharing. So it gave me an opportunity to speak about gender expansion, about gender liberation, about combating stigma, about being the best version of ourselves, this kind of thing. And so that's really, for me, where my work started. It started always in the activism. The music came almost secondary to that. People would invite me to come and speak, just how I'm speaking here with you. And then they say, but you're a musician, right? Like, play us some songs after the fact. And I'd be like, well, I just drum for other people. I don't even have my own music. So I started playing music off the back of the marathon story going viral. I think I've noticed, in terms specifically in terms of social media, we understand how it works. It's small, it's bite-sized, it's like easy to understand, it's shareable, these kinds of things. You know, the captions are clear. The best content on social media is the stuff that makes the person who's consuming it feel like they want to share it with the next person because they're like, oh yeah, this is me. Or like, oh yeah, this really touched me, so I wanted to touch somebody else. I think uh, virality and growing your platform is when you're delivering real value. I really believe that, delivering real value. The second thing that I think really helps is collaborating, partnering with folks who really believe in what you're doing, but have a bigger platform than you. And again, it's not like they're doing you the favor. They're like, oh gosh, I wanna be credited with uh, you know, being the first to put you on, right? That's how entrepreneurs work. They're, the VCs are looking to be the ones to invest first in the biggest next company. I think when we're motivated by something that's pure, and then on the practical side, as you said, we're delivering real value, whether it's knowledge, whether it's a product, whether it's music, art, when we're delivering real value, it makes it easy for larger, more influential people to want to help us, want us to grow, want to put us on. So those are some of the two biggest things, you know, m making sure that the intention is pure and then collaborating with larger, more influential people because I'm delivering value that they see. Slide? Yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. So, great. Yep. So this is the, I know, I know, I know. It's okay. I, you can hear me. We can do voice of goddess. Yeah, voice of goddess style. So this was the concept of when I went to Antarctica. So this was the first pack that I played for you a little bit. Then I went out to Stanford and I started making my own underwater microphones which I feel like would be a really green schoolish project. So, Pac Alex, <laughs> let's learn how to build some underwater microphones. So then this is literally Antarctica. Have you all been to Antarctica? It's wild. Yeah, we have, exactly. It's completely beautiful. It's just like freedom. And so I would just be off the side of this raft and I would put the mics under the water and just peacefully meditate and listen. On the far left, this beautiful penguin was like really singing to me. Obviously, they have um, a lot of wild wildlife protection, and so you keep a respectful distance from the animals. But what they do uh, say is that when the animals come to you, then it's okay. So I felt very lucky that this penguin uh, really understood the assignment. <laughs> and I think with this work, it is solo. You know, it's very solo. Like you're in the headphones listening to nature and connecting. And in the pandemic, that was the inspiration for this project because nature was the only place that I could be. And so recording the nature sounds and then bringing it back into my studio to produce beats using only those nature sounds as like a creative assignment was a huge inspiration for me. And it's been a big part of my shift, um, prioritizing my own spirituality in my life through my connection with music and nature. On the left is a seal eating a penguin. On the right is a penguin that's still alive. <laughs> it's the natural process of life, my beautiful friends. 
So here on the left side is this beautiful space at, at Stanford's um, Center for Music uh, Research in Music Acoustics and Technology. It's called the Listening Room, where they have 36 ambisonic speakers. So when I'd play back the Antarctica sounds and some of the sounds that I had recorded in nature using an ambisonic 360 degree microphone, you sit in the middle of the room to recreate the environment that you were in. So if a penguin was sitting singing to my right in the listening room, that sound will only come from the right. Does that make sense? It's creating a 3D image of the uh, experience. I'd work with my team. This is my engineer, Kevin, on the right. And we would just sit for hours organizing all of the different sounds. And then what you start doing in order to turn it into the more electronic sounds that you heard in the first example is you microsample. So what does that mean? I'll take a tiny, tiny piece of a penguin singing, and then I'll turn it into a hi-hat. Or I'll sample a super large piece of the glaciers underwater and turn that into a really um, long rise. You know, in electronic music where people are like, dunsa, 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 like that kind of thing. You can make all that in Ableton with the raw audio material being from Antarctica. Beat making, what does that mean? So once I've created, you know, if you read the list on the left, you have ice roll, you have splash from underwater, you have wind boom, you have rock snap, wa water tom, like you just name, like you're tired, you know, so you just be naming stuff kind of randomly, but this is the process. It's very vulnerable when you show your um, disorganized studio files, but this is more or less what it looks like. And so you're making beats, you know, um, sampling each of the different micro, sa micro sounds. And then, uh, do you want to hear the penguin beat? This is just an example of what's possible. <laughs> I invite you to close your eyes because staring at a SoundCloud screen isn't actually it. I invite you to close your eyes and just listen. Yeah, we got a bit dramatic with it. <laughs> Punch forward, keep listening. Yeah, we had a sense of humor with it. Yeah, you have to have a sense of humor, you know, playful, keep it lighthearted. So again, this beat is not something that's public. It's just me like in my studio being like, okay, let me test the validity of this pack. Like, could I as a producer go and make something? So this is just an example of something random that I made that's pretty, but the possibilities are infinite uh, once the pack comes out. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that it's called penguins. Yeah, that's yeah. That's like the cutest thing in the world. That's, you have to keep it lighthearted, you, you know. Keep it lighthearted. Is there, an, uh, is there a question about this that I can yeah, answer? Yeah, I was going to say, is there any more questions based on this? Because it's like open up a whole new, new space. Yeah. Hi, Karen. I'm Angel. Love the energy. Thanks so much for coming to Green School Valley. Actually, I'm an employee here. I'm not sure as your parents or teachers. So, my question will be. You've got all these things, right? You're, you've achieved your academic career, professional career, music career. So what's next? I'm really curious about it. And maybe what, what kind of um, maybe campaign or social change you would like to address um, aside from what you're doing now? Maybe something new? Really would love to know. Thanks so much. Thank you for this. When you were saying it, I'll be, you know what came to mind? I was like, I want to be a parent. Like, I'm so excited to be a parent. Like, really, I feel that, like, deeply in my heart. I'm so excited for that. So that feels exciting 
Truly, truly. Uh, because I think just the joy of being with kids gives me a lot of energy and I feel, I don't know, I just, it, it seems exciting. It seems beautiful. So that's like one thing that's very important to me. Um, the next thing I think is focusing more on just larger wisdom and, and spirituality. So when you ask me about a campaign or an issue, it's interesting because of course there are so many like on the ground activist issues that are important to me that I get asked to speak about or, or champion or, or like, you know, donate money to things like that. And I, and I do. But I think what's most motivating to me is, is just allowing folks to tap into their higher joy, their higher potential, their higher wisdom. I like the idea of us evolving the human consciousness towards love and away from fear. I want to be a love agent, Angel. That's really what I feel, you know? Um, I think my music, the lyrics that are coming out, that there, I have a music coming out in 10 days on December 23rd. It's like a Christmas, you know, early Christmas gift. Yeah. So that project is called Vibrations. And that album is really going to be focused on more love, more strength in being loving, kind, open, spirited. People think that when we're kind, we're pushovers. No. Kindness means that you good with yourself, that you actually have something to give somebody else. Wow. Power leadership, wisdom, this motivates me. So I think some babies, and I think like moving the human consciousness forward, you know, you know, acro yoga in Bali, hanging out with talented kids, like making music, making penguin beats, I, you know, it's a nice life. Yeah, yeah, it's simple, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Kieran, just to help with that, I'm about to take a 20-hour journey with a three-year-old. So I'll, set, I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> Thank then you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Babies yeah, exactly. are still I, on the list. I was waiting for somebody to check me on that. But yeah. I think I think you only have to do it once, right? Technically, like with that baby. Like if they just, they're only that year once. Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'll let you know how it goes when he's five, six and all those other years. <laughs> but I'm sure it'll be a dream when he's four. But three, that's the tricky one. It's three. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. It's hard to run in this, by the way. What's your like final token of wisdom for people our age and I don't know how we can be better right now, like most immediate change? When you ask that, yeah, claps for that question. Thank you. When you asked me the question that came to mind immediately I really wanted to just tell you, spend time by yourself. Spend time by yourself. And the reason why I say that is, sometimes we don't have enough time to hear ourselves think. What do we want? What do I want? What lights me up? That's real leadership. It's very important for us to be in community. It's very important for us to be connected. At the same time, we're very influenced and shaped by our community. So lucky for you, y'all are in a great community. I would like to be shaped by this community. I would be joyful to be influenced by this community. At the same time, in order to contribute, to push the community forward, we have to step into our own individual power, our own individual opinion. What do I think? What do I want? What do I need? So my best piece of wisdom for each of you is to make sure that whether it's on a daily basis for a 10 minute meditation, a weekly basis, a walk in nature, going for a run, Spend some time with yourself. What do I think? What lights me up? What drains me? Be your best friend. Know yourself. When you can take care of yourself, you always gonna have something to give. You always gonna have the ability to contribute. So know yourself, know yourself, know yourself. Good question. Thank I think, you. I think that's the, the drop the mic question, right? Um, well, you are nourished by this community. You are nurtured by this community. You are so much part of the community. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Just a big round of applause for Kieran Gandhi, please.